Good evening. evening. Welcome to worship on this Monday, Thursday. It is such a joy to be here with my colleagues, Pastor Tyler and Pastor Amy and Pastor Dave, and to welcome you all to Zion Lutheran Church. And it's really First Lutheran, United Methodist Church, Hector, Buffalo Lake, New Life, Zion and St. Paul's, all under one roof, praising God in a really unique way. So I'm just overjoyed to share this evening with you. Thank you to everyone, especially these guys up here in Togas, um, prepared and practiced and who will portray the disciples on the night where Jesus was betrayed. There were so many people that went into planning this. I can't begin to thank everyone. So everyone who's planned uh, the music, the light, the sound, the oh, couple lightings, technology, script runners. Oh, and that meal. Who has enjoyed that meal before we started? So thank you for that wonderful meal. Let's give them a hand. So if the disciples fall asleep between scenes, just make sure you nudge each other to wake each other up. So thank you again for being here as we enter into this most holy of weeks together. Um, more announcements, and I forgot to ask, so I'm going to ask each pastor, when is your Sunday worship service? Pastor Dave? I'll put you on the spot. Sorry. All right, we can do this. All right. Uh, there is 7.30 sunrise service in Hector at the Methodist Church, and then with breakfast to follow. And Zion Methodist Church is going to lead off with breakfast with worship to follow at 10 o'clock. So worship time is 730 and 10 o'clock with breakfast in between. <laughs> at First Lutheran, we worship at 7 a.m. and breakfast at 8 and we'll worship again at 930. At New Life Community Church, we're going to have breakfast at 9, and then we're going to have worship at 10. And at St. Paul's in Hector, we will worship on sunrise at 7 a.m. and have breakfast to follow. And here at Zion, the worship will start at 9, and breakfast will be proceeding. So please find a place to worship and know that you're welcome in all of our churches. I'm sorry I don't know when the Catholic Church worships. Um, we can spread that word too. So just find a place where you can praise your risen Savior on Sunday. Uh, tomorrow night we gather, and we gather for our Good Friday service, looking at some of the last words of Jesus, some very powerful words. And we will gather at Zion Methodist Church, and I want to make that very clear because there's a, a funeral visitation here tomorrow night. So you, when you see the cars, don't stop here, although you would be welcome Make sure you go to the Methodist Church over for worship. Any other announcements? Then please stand as you're able for our prayer of confession. Friends in Christ, in this Lenten season, we have heard our Lord's call to struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and from loving each other. Within the community of the church, God never wearies of forgiving sin and giving the peace of reconciliation. As we remember this night of betrayal and desertion, let us confess our sins before God and one another and enter the celebration of the great three days, reconciled with God and one another. Merciful God, we have not loved you with all our heart and mind and strength and soul. Lord, have mercy upon us. We have not loved our neighbors as you have taught us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. We are indifferent 
to the saving grace of your word and life. Lord, have mercy upon us. Jesus said, I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The good news, therefore, is this. In Jesus Christ, we are loved and we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. Later, Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house. The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him, one after another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated.
Your appreciation of this drama, The Living Last Supper, will be greatly enhanced if you will now bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. Please do not open your eyes until you hear the words of Christ when he says, One of you will betray me. The scene you are about to witness took place in an upper room in Jerusalem the night before Christ was crucified. Jesus and the twelve disciples were eating the Passover meal together. The disciples don't know it is the last time they will eat with their teacher and friend, Jesus. The Italian painter da Vinci was one of history's most astonishing interpreters of the Christian faith. The scene you will see in a moment is patterned after the painting, The Last Supper. All of the pictures which preceded da Vinci's seem mere attempts, all that followed imitations. For da Vinci has truly captured an electric moment which took place at this supper. Here is a portrayed action. As the disciples are startled, each in a different way, by the tragic pronouncement made by Christ. One registers horror. Another cried, this is preposterous. Another disbelieves what he has heard and reaches for a companion to confirm that his ears have not tricked him. Still another begs Christ to reveal the name of the betrayer, while yet another stoutly proclaims his own innocence. Judas draws back from Christ, overturning a salt shaker as he clutches tightly in his fist the bag containing his pitiful reward for betraying his master. Jesus alone is calm in the wake of the turmoil his six words have created in this moment. It is at this point that we share what each of the disciples remembered of how he came to Christ and how he felt about him. What are these six words? One of you will betray me. I am James, elder brother of John and son of Zebedee. We were fishermen with our friends, Andrew and Simon Peter, when Jesus called us to become his disciples. John and I were quick to anger in those early days. One time, when traveling to Jerusalem, the people of a little town refused us food and shelter. We had walked many miles that day and were foot sore and weary. John and I were furious at the lack of courtesy. Angrily, I asked Jesus, Lord, let us call down fire from heaven to destroy this miserable little town in menace. But sternly, Jesus replied, shaking his head, No, you do not know what you ask. The Son of Man did not come to destroy, but to save. Then, seeing our shamed faces, he knowingly added, You two brothers are as fierce and quick as thunder and lightning. So, sons of thunder we became. I have tried to quiet my thunder most of the time, but I get so angry with those who don't trust Jesus that sometimes it is hard to control my temper. Peter, John, and I were constant companions of Jesus. We were with him in Gethsemane that awful night before the crucifixion. I can never forget the desolation that we felt. 
My burning faith caused me to be the first martyr for, of the twelve disciples. When King Herod Agrippa started persecuting the church, I was beheaded, thus fulfilling the prophecy of Jesus when he said, This cup that I drink, you shall drink also. Even though I had to pay the extreme sacrifice for my faith, being martyred for Christ, I wouldn't change a moment of my time spent with him. My experience with Christ was wonderful, beyond imagination. It is even said that my courage and forgiveness during my trial won my prosecutor over to the Christian faith. Though at times the situation was fearful and grim, I never doubted that Jesus was my king. I am John, brother of James. James has spoken of me and how, in spite of our quick tempers and foolish impulsiveness, Jesus loved us dearly. Leaving our family to follow Jesus was the most important decision of our lives. I'm the youngest of the disciples, and my time with Jesus was exhilarating. I watched his many miracles and excitement with awe, and I saw how his love and concerns drew hundreds of people to him. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, our master served the first communion. I sat on Jesus' right-hand side. He talked of betrayal, of being taken from us. He seemed to be in some private agony that none of us could comprehend. I shall never forget that terrible day when Jesus was crucified. The others fled, but I could not leave my Lord. He asked me to take care of his mother. And it was all I could do for him. C can you imagine how we felt when we heard that Jesus was risen? I outran Peter to the tomb in my haste to know it was true. Later in my life, I was banished to the Isle of Patmos. There I was given visions of the last days, which I wrote down in the book of Revelation. The closing years of my life were spent at Ephesus. I was the last of the twelve to bear earthly witness of Christ and live to see the end of the first century. I am Philip, Nathaniel's brother. I first came to Bethany to hear John the Baptist speak, and while there I met Jesus. I found him a very interesting person and a very powerful speaker. I was so moved by Jesus that I had to bring Nathaniel to hear him also. For many months, we traveled with the Master, up and down Palestine. I saw the lame walk erect, the blind made to see, and even some who were dead brought back to life. Soon, I realized that Jesus was indeed the true Messiah, but I still had much to learn. When Jesus told us that God was our Heavenly Father, it was almost beyond my understanding. It was I who asked him, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. Jesus replied, After all I have done and said, Philip, do you not know that I am in the Father and he is in me? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Startled, I drew back from Jesus. But suddenly I began to understand. Had I been blind? For months I had watched Jesus at work. I looked, but did not see. I heard what he said, but did not understand. I had accepted what Jesus did and then demanded more proof. My sense of failure served to strengthen my newborn conviction. And after the ascension, I spent my life as a missionary for Christ. I died a martyr. If I had my life to live over, I would gladly follow Jesus again and would be even more faithful than the first time.
I am James the Lesser, son of Alphaeus and Mary. History does not tell much of my life. There is even confusion about who I really am or how closely I am related to Jesus. Whether I was his brother or not seems unimportant. What is important is that he called on me to become one of his disciples, and I answered his call. The lessons I learned while with him changed my life completely. When Jesus was crucified on that cross, it seemed as if part of me died there with him. But when he appeared in the upper room, it gave me new life and new spirit. So much so that on the day of Pentecost, I was able to preach the good news with great joy and happiness. Later in my life, I served as a leader in the church at Jerusalem. I am sometimes referred to as the Bishop of Jerusalem. My faith was a vital part in my life. By declaring my faith to all Jerusalem from the temple ramparts, I angered the scribes and Pharisees. In their rage, they threw me to the ground. The fall didn't kill me, so my attackers stoned me. When my master died, he called on God to forgive his murders. How could I do anything less? I am glad that I remain loyal to the master to the very end. As a follower of Christ, it was my desire to show that Jesus came to reconcile man to man and man to God. I am Andrew. I'm not particularly gifted. I'm just an average man like any one of you. I was a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee when I met John the Baptist. His challenging message moved me to follow him until the day Jesus appeared. I knew at once that I had found the Messiah. I hurried to find my brother Simon Peter and said to him, we have found the Messiah. Peter also believed and we followed the master, having me, leaving behind our family and our fishing nets to become fishers of men. On the day when Jesus fed the 5,000, it was I who drew attention to the lad with five loaves and two fishes. How incredible to feed so many with so little. Jesus filled our lives with many such wonders. My life ended in Petri. There, the Roman proconsul, outraged by the refusal to offer a sacrifice to pagan gods, had me scrounged and crucified. I died a martyr for Christ. I served my life for his cause, but I received so much more. I am Thaddeus. In John's Gospel, I am called Jude. Matthew and Mark referred to me as Libius. I became a disciple because I liked the way Jesus walked boldly and bravely among all kinds of people. I thought that Jesus was the kind of leader that was needed. He had good common sense, he loved his fellow countrymen, and he was devoted to his cause. The problem was that I did not fully understand his cause. I thought that by preparing for the coming kingdom of God on earth, he would restore Israel and its old power and glory. How wrong I was. He talked about loving our enemies and returning good for evil. And he didn't even try to stir us up or reveal himself to the people in the way I thought he would. Finally, I asked him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to the disciples and not to the whole world? Jesus answered, because I will only reveal myself to those who love me and obey me. I was disappointed. And yet I knew Jesus was well enough to think there was much meaning in his words. But it was not until after Jesus died that I came to understand that I'd asked him to show me his power. And he had replied that his power was the power of love. 
When I finally understood my master, it became my desire as a follower of Christ to share with others the light and healing with Jesus brought into this world. I am Thomas, often I am called Didymus, the twin. You know me as Doubting Thomas. Even though I was a man of wavering faith, my devotion to Jesus was very sincere. Like him, I had been a carpenter and I felt closer to Jesus because of my work. I am a realist and it confused and discouraged me to see the criticism of Jesus growing. We disciples were almost too afraid to go with Jesus to Jerusalem that last time. I became so impatient with our indecision that I blurted out, let us go with him even to die if need be. So we went. Even now it chills me to think of how prophetic my words were. We were all together for the Passover. The day was dark and oppressive as we heard Jesus speak of leaving us. I asked him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How do we find the way? Jesus revealed his purpose to us when he answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. Any man who comes to the Father must come through me. I was desolate after the crucifixion. I stayed away from the other disciples for a while. And when I turned, returned to the upper room, they said, He has risen! I just couldn't believe them. And I said, I won't believe it until I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them and place my hands into his side. But when I saw him and heard him speak my name, I had to believe. This man was my Lord and my God. I rejoice today that I believed in the Master and that I gave my service to the King of Kings. I gave my life as a martyr for faith in Jesus Christ and gladly would do it again. I am Judas Iscariot. I know I am known to all the world as a traitor who sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Yes, I betrayed the Christ with a kiss. I first received my call as an apostle by the Sea of Tiberias. I was always a man of ambitious design. In fact, in the early days, I cherished a hope that Jesus would establish an earthly kingdom and that I would have a prominent position in his political setup. I acted as the treasurer for the original 12 apostles, disciples. I followed Jesus, not for spiritual motives, but rather for personal gain. As a cover-up for my greed and hypocrisy, I pretended to be zealous in all my duties I was always watching for ways to get more money. When Mary anointed at the feet of Jesus, I protested. Why wasn't this ointment sold for 300 shillings and the money given to the poor? I managed to conceal my true motives from the disciples, but somehow I couldn't seem to fool the Christ. He was so very patient with me, once he even said, haven't I chosen 12 of you and one of you is the devil? Jesus knew my true motives, but the other disciples never guessed I was a traitor. Then one night he said, what you're going to do, do quickly. Immediately, I turned my back on my master and went out into the night. I sought revenge. So I sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. I led the mob to the Garden of Gethsemane 
where we found Jesus at prayer. And I betrayed him into the hands of the enemy with a kiss. And when I kissed him, he called me friend. His words of love pierced me. My heart sank within me. And my face burnt with the guilt of a traitor. My lust for revenge was satisfied, but almost at once I realized what a terrible mistake I had made. I was a victim of Satan. I was sorry for my mistake, but being a spiritual coward, I refused to ask Jesus for another chance. I knew he would give it to me, just as he had done for Peter. But I had played with sin until it had consumed me. My tragic end is known to all the world. Lex Chius, I am a tax collector. Some call me Levi, others call me Matthew, the publican. It is said that there is no class of men in the world more hated than tax collectors. However, that did not stop this man called Jesus. In fact, he came to my office one day and said, follow me. There's no way I could resist. So I left everything and followed him. Later, I gave him a great feast at my home and many of his disciples and my business friends were present. When some of the Pharisees complained to Jesus about eating with publicans and sinners, Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a doctor. Those who are sick do. From that day when I repented and followed him, the ancient scriptures became a way of life for me and I was convinced that Jesus was the fulfillment of every prophecy about becoming Messiah. I first preached this good news in Judea to my own countrymen. It was said that I never had there been a man more unsuited for the job than I. But in the hands of Jesus Christ, I became the first man to write down his teachings. I became missionary of the gospel in every way possible, but no one received more rewards than I. Jesus took me from the life of money and gave me riches of a far greater kind. My name is Nathaniel, but some call me Bartholomew. It was my brother Philip who told me that he had found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. I couldn't believe my ears and asked him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip ignored my sarcasm and insisted that I go with him. When Jesus saw us coming, he looked and said, here comes an honest man, a true son of Israel. That stopped me short. How do you know who I am? I demanded. Jesus looked steadily back at me and replied, I knew who you were even before Philip found you. Filled with elation, I called, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. I knew within my heart that he was the Christ and that I, Nathaniel, needed him. I followed him for three years as one of his disciples. After Jesus ascended into heaven, I worked with the other disciples in Jerusalem. Later I traveled as a missionary in Persia, Egypt, and Armenia. The true manner of my death is not recorded. Some say I was crucified or beheaded. Some even say I was flayed alive. How I died is not important. What matters is that I died gladly for my Savior. My torturers destroyed my earthly body and put an end to my earthly ministry. But they could not destroy my soul, which lives today in the mansion of heaven, with Christ, my Savior. I am 
Simon the Zealot. Before Jesus called me, I belonged to the group of hot-headed, bloodthirsty revolutionaries known as Zealots. I hated Rome for enslaving my country, and I hated God for turning his back on us. My Jewish brothers seemed not to care that they were slaves in their own kingdom. But one day, while I was by the Sea of Tiberias, I met Jesus of Nazareth. He told me of another kind of kingdom, the kingdom of the human heart, where God reigns supreme. Since that day, my attitude toward Rome, toward God, and toward my fellow man has changed. My inner tensions have been relieved. I am not uptight about things anymore. He gave me a balance in life that I had not enjoyed before, a peace beyond understanding. I recognized in him the hope and the answer for all humankind. I couldn't help following him because he was the greatest person I had ever known. Unconditionally and completely, I surrendered myself to him, to think his thoughts, to love as he loves, to obey as he obeys, and to serve as he serves. After the cross, I was still there. I dedicated my life to the ways of the Christ. There is no breach between people that cannot be healed when they love Christ. I am Simon Peter. I was a fisherman when my brother Andrew here brought me to Jesus. Jesus looked at me and he told me, your name shall be Cephas, meaning rock or stone. Maybe he saw already in me the faith and steadfastness that I would yearn for and which would take so long to grow. I was so headstrong and my impulsive spirit caused me to do and say many things for which I am now very sorry. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when the mob came after Jesus, I drew my sword to protect him and I cut off the ear of a slave. Jesus was furious. Put your sword back, put your sword back in its sheath, he said, for those that live by the sword will die by the sword. And I fled in shame and terror. It was I who boasted that I would never forsake Jesus. And then, in the face of danger, I cursed and I denied my Savior. Three times I did this. And yet when Jesus asked, Who do men say that I am? You are Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. After our Master ascended into heaven, I became one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. On the day of Pentecost, the Lord spoke through me, and he converted 3,000 souls. My life ended when I was 75. I died in the city of Rome, crucified as a martyr for Christ. I asked to die head downwards because I knew that I was not worthy to resemble my Lord even in my death. My life was like the shifting sand until I found Christ. In him I found my true and my sure foundation. Praised is he of whose bounty we have partaken, and through whose goodness we live. Praised are you, O Eternal, our God, ruler of the universe, who nourishes the whole world in goodness, grace, loving kindness and compassion. He gives food to all flesh, for his mercy is everlasting. Because of his enduring goodness, we have not lacked sustenance 
for all living things of his creation. Praised are you, O Eternal, who provides food for all. Take, eat, this is my body. Praise be to you, O Eternal, our God, ruler of the universe, for the vine and the fruit of the vine, and for the produce of the field, and for the goodly and pleasant land which you were pleased to give as an inheritance to our fathers. O Eternal God, let your compassion pour out on your people, on your city, Jerusalem, and on Zion, the abode of your glory. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I shall not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. What you are going to do, do quickly. In the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it to, to all, saying, This cup is the new covenant, my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Please stand as you're able. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that our Lord is good. Tonight we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion together. You will come up with the direction of the ushers up the center aisle. We will have two stations with bread and two with wine. So you'll come up and we will tell you the body of Christ given for you and you'll say amen. Um, we'll break off a piece of bread for you 
and then you'll go to the next station, which will be the cup on either side, so you'll actually go back through the side you came from. The blood of Christ is shed for you. There will be two cups. The light color is the grape juice, and the dark color is the wine. So you may be seated for our communion.
Let us pray. You can join me in our bulletins here as we pray the uh, post-communion prayer. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you've given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Before we uh, have our sending, I do want to thank our gentlemen here. We can, uh, I feel they need an applause. And after all, all the workers, tech people, everyone, uh, thank you as well. And my brothers and sisters in ministry, uh, it's, it's a real thrill to do this to me. Um, this is wonderful. Look around. Uh, this is the way it's going to be in heaven. There, there's no denominations. There's nothing like that. We're going to be worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And uh, again, I thank you for coming. I thank everyone who helped because as it says, uh, uh, we don't do these things on our own, uh, in our own power. It's the Holy Spirit that works in us. Uh, um, we, as as uh, the creed meaning says, I believe that I cannot by my own understanding and effort come to Jesus Christ my Lord, but the Holy Spirit calls us through the gospel. So thank you all for hearing the Spirit's call. Now I invite you all to stand as we uh, together will read the sending for Monday Thursday. This night is our calling to go into the world, scattered to the ends of the earth, to love as Christ loved, to serve in the name of Christ. It is our calling to remember, even in our darkest hour, who we are. We remember that Christ is always with us. So go into the world to give yourself to us. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go in peace, serve the Lord.